Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Bob Bennis. Broadcasting from the studios in the Cousin Center, the hub of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, overlooking beautiful Lake Michigan. Good morning and welcome to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. Let's say hello to the host of Living Our Faith, Archbishop Jerome Listecki. Good morning, Your Excellency. Hey, good morning, Bob. Good morning. We live in a we live in a culture where we must do good, we must do well, we must succeed. So there's graduation. Always this pressure. is graduation, graduation time. You know, so a lot of the students trying to finish up, trying to get things done. A lot of pressure on there. But we also we live in a world for the for people out in the workplace. There there's always challenges out there. There's challenges to keep doing what is right, to do what is good. And I think today when you when you look at the guests that we have today the pressure that this man and his associates must have been under uh, intense pressure more and more um, basically in our society there's a, a division especially in our society where we want to privatize faith and, and religion faith and religion are okay for the um, 45 minutes hour and 15 minutes hour on and Sunday. a half on Sunday mm-hmm. um, uh, but it, it but it, it's not almost not permissible um, even discouraged to take uh, your religion and live it out um, uh, basically in the in the community and yet you know we're based upon um, at least as a as a people and a nation upon the freedom to be able to express that mm-hmm. um, you you'll hear idealized saying you know we want a voice of everyone's voice at the table but when they gag you and muffle you uh, mm-hmm. you know it's hard to basically to get that voice out and yet you know our Catholics are called upon to, to take their faith, you know, into the um, into the working community to take their their faith um, uh, into the society and and, and to live it be, because it's our task, it's our mission. Exactly. Our guest today is Jerry Buting, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it is because he was part of a ten series uh, program on Netflix. He was one of the attorneys for Stephen Avery that was recently on. I'd say about six months ago it broke on Netflix, and uh, Jerry has been out and about all across, all across the country um, interviewing and being interviewed, and we are happy to have you here with us today. If you would, tell us a little bit about your faith background, uh, your growing up, your family life. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Bob, it's good to be here. Archbishop. Mr. Beauty, in the interest of full disclosure... Right. There is a Buting studying for the priesthood in Rome, uh, isn't there? Yes, there is. Who is, who is. is that, that Buting, and what's your relation? And what is your relationship <laughs> to him, counselor? That is our son. <laughs> you should be very proud of him, uh, yes, too. Yes, we are very proud of him. He's done a great job. I was there recently, so I got a chance to go out to uh, to dinner with him and his uh, and, and basically the other um, Milwaukee seminarians. We actually were visiting him, my whole family, in January when all of this broke about uh, the making a murderer um, publicity and the internet exploding and all that. So that was really kind of an interesting experience. W- wonderful. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to get that sure. full disclosure off in case somebody <laughs> thinks that suddenly it's a little nepotism. We've got the beauty separated, you know, and we and do. We're trying trying our best with his son, very much so, much so to get him steered on that great great path right to uh, all the way to heaven. And he's going to help a lot of people get to heaven also. Yes, God willing, God willing. He's, you know, we support him, certainly, my wife and I. I was born, you know, cradle Catholic, went through grade school, Catholic grade school, Jesuit high school in Indianapolis. And, uh, and then I sort of drifted away, frankly, during college uh, and young adult and didn't attend church regularly. It was really the sacrament of marriage that kind of brought me back into my the practice sure. of my faith. When uh, my wife, who wasn't Catholic, was baptized Episcopalian, but really was unchurched, really grew up with not even Sunday schools mostly. When we decided to, to get married, she's like, well, what judge should we use? I said, judge, I don't know that I would feel married if I didn't get married in the church. She says, well, I want you to feel married, so we're going to get married in the church. Good for her. (laughs) Yes. And she has since uh, become Catholic and um, really loves her faith and is deeply involved as well. We got married uh, at Holy Rosary, now part of Three Holy Women, Mm -hmm. Um, had two children, two years apart, a boy and a girl. 
Grace and uh, Stephen Grace. Later built a house, moved out in Brookfield, and we are now members of St. Dominic's in Brookfield and very involved, both of us. I'm, I've been on the parish council, I'm a trustee, and you know we really try and give back wherever we can. And her educational background is, she is? My wife. Uh-huh. My wife is also a criminal defense attorney. Oh my gosh, oh. That, those table conversations really <laughs> can imagine. Something. You know, <laughs> defend having the beef medium rare as opposed to well done. <laughs> defend it. <laughs> well, we uh, I actually met her uh, on my first day as a lawyer. It was also her first day at the public defender's office in Milwaukee. Wow. And we became friends and then later fell in love. And um, the funny thing, my, my wife would actually, would, when the, the children would act up and they would get punishments, um, if they would come and protest and make a good, logical, reasoned <laughs> argument, she would give them credit and sometimes reduce their punishment. So, well, so, so she she was uh, also a counselor and a judge at the same time. She actually became a judge for for a year. Uh, she was actually a Waukesha Circuit Court judge. Uh-huh. Um, then she was defeated in an election, but but even before then, yeah, you could see her. The Solomon's wisdom coming through her when it came to punishments. Do you have to plead your same case before, just like sometimes, the, the sometimes I do. That's an interesting twist on on go ask your father or go go ask your mother when when you plead your case to one parent, uh, right? Interesting. And, and we work together mm-hmm. in the same law firm. Wow, small firm. Wow. So we well, see each other every day. It's great. Both, both cr- uh, criminal. Both uh, criminal defense is our specialty. It's a question do. most people ask uh, immediately. You might as well just get it out of the way. How, sure. how can you defend somebody who's a criminal? How how can you take somebody who is uh, who has worked uh, you know against the society who's basically committed and defend them? Well, you know, I get that question all the time, as you might imagine. And there's kind of two answers. One is. Frankly, it is a lot easier to defend somebody who's guilty than it is somebody who's innocent. The, the, the personal pressure that you have with somebody's liberty at stake for who's, who's truly innocent, you believe is truly innocent, is, is a very challenging burden to take. On the other hand, you know, whether guilty or innocent, uh, you know, I believe in the value and worth of every human soul. And you know, that, that moves me, I believe in it wholeheartedly. It's part of my vocation that, that I look at my career as a vocation. You know, Jesus said to, you know, visit the imprisoned and minister to the imprisoned. And, you know, it, it's sometimes very difficult to advocate in this day and age in the criminal justice system for people. But, you know, to try and get them to see the, the, the dignity of the human soul of every person. Mm-hmm. But I believe that, you know, other than of maybe a very small slice of, of people who are charged or convicted, almost everybody can be redeemed and uh, rehabilitated. But, you know, at least in most of my career, the focus has been on punishment, retribution, or even outright revenge, which are not very Christian values in my in my estimation. So I, I'm constantly up against that uh, in the criminal courts and trying to to uh, slow down the the um, assembly line of nameless numbered people and get the judge and the prosecutors and the jury to understand this is a human being. And when you look at it from those perspectives... The, 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 the rampant recidivism that we have of habitual criminals, because they're not being rehabilitated, it's all about punishment. Right. Um, that would explain a lot of that. Right. And people need a helping hand, you mm-hmm. know, especially people who are, for various reasons, they're, they either lack education or vocational skills. Um, what I try and do is, you know, I, over the years, I've found that people that have a faith life, really, whether it's the, the defendant or the family, they really are able to get through these crises of criminal prosecution, mm-hmm. trial, you know, s- s- prison if they're if they're convicted. People with faith get through that better, and I, I try and convey that to my clients and and encourage them if they've if they've had a faith life and sort of drifted away, try and get back to it. If they have never really experienced it, to try and open their hearts to that. People need a hand spiritually too, and mm-hmm. you know so. A lot of a lot of times, the recidivism we see is because there's just nobody there to help these people uh, back on the straight path. And as as Americans, uh, we have a thing called the Constitution. I know a lot of people kind of avoid that Constitution uh, today, ig- right. ignore it. But um, insured within those uh, Bill of Rights is the due process of every citizen. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm sure as a, um, a lawyer. You could almost uh, contextualize it as speaking another language. And when a, 
Um, right. An average citizen comes before the court, which is very daunting, you know, right. uh, judging the black robes and individuals who are there are calling people basically to silence and attention, basically right. in, the, in the courtroom. You need, in, in the best sense of the word, an advocate. You need somebody who can speak mm-hmm. the language, right. who can speak for you, who can help you understand, you know, this, this strange process that's going on. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the power of the, of the government versus the individual is what you, we encounter every day in our courts. And, um, you know, the, the little guy, whether they're uh, a person of means or like 90 percent of the people that are prosecuted, poor people, they do need an advocate with them to try and um, make sure that due process is followed, to make sure that, that, that they're humanized. And Jerry, it's obvious that um, your, your, your faith you take your faith right into what you do, and you even help and um, uh, others to kind of understand you know, the importance of developing uh, that faith. Do you, do you find yourself, you know, taking your work into your own personal prayer life? I do. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, it's I've had a, a lot of challenges in my life um, that that have steered me in various directions, and and. Uh, you know, prayer has been a big part of me overcoming those challenges, and 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 I think it's a big part of whatever success I've achieved. And so I, I often pray for, uh, you know, to give, to to channel God through me th- with the Holy Spirit to help me to try and stay on the stay focused on what's important, to try and and search out those those areas in a case that maybe um, most need. Attention, it's definitely a part of my life. Do you pray with the people that you're representing? Does that come up often? Or not, not often o- enough? <laughs> not often, frankly. You know, I have to be careful. I can't, I don't want to be preachy about my faith with right. people because I'm there really as their advocate. Mm-hmm. But I'm also there as their counselor. And so I can, I can, I try and give them the benefit of some of my years of experience and, and what works in other cases with other people and what doesn't. And they're free to ignore my advice. Um, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they ignore my legal advice as well. We're talking with Jerry Buting, and Jerry is a criminal defense lawyer. He is also a parishioner over at St. Dom's in Brookfield. Uh, he, you probably were recognizing the name from the Stephen Avery case uh, that was on Netflix entitled Making a Murderer. We're going to take a break. We're going to listen to the news from our friends over at the Catholic Herald. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. A trip to the hospital can be an intimidating event for patients and their families. Oftentimes, a hospitalization will require rehabilitation after discharge. The way this transition is handled is critical to the health and well-being of your loved one. St. Camillus Rehabilitation maintains a standard of excellence, and our record proves it. 99% of our discharged patients return to functioning at the same level or higher prior to their rehab stay, and the average length of stay is just 24 days. Satisfied patients is evidenced by our post-discharge satisfaction surveys, which average a 4.5 out of a 5-star rating. Hear about the St. Camillus mission from nursing administrator Sandra Dugan. We strive to practice the St. Camillus mission by providing holistic care, and this can be assured through physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual care needs that we will meet in our continuum of care and in all phases of life. For more information regarding St. Camillus Rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. Good morning. I'm Grace David with highlights from this week's Catholic Herald and CatholicHerald.org. If you have ever spent time looking for your car keys when you were in a hurry to get somewhere, you'll understand exactly what Father Matthew Witter is talking about in his column titled, Key to God's Word Opens Door. Answers to life's deepest questions come when we stop trying to create our own answers, but instead let the voice of God, recognized in prayer and spoken prophetically through others, speak to us. He writes, How often is it that when we do take a step back and give up trying to figure things out on our own, that God is able to speak and God's Word gets results? Read Father Matt's entire reflection on Sunday scripture readings in the Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. Good people doing good things include the Acts Youth Ministry from three Catholic parishes in Racine that recently participated in that community's Blue Mass, a Mass celebrated for those who work in the public safety field. During the Mass, The youth went up to each police officer and presented him or her with a lapel pin of St. Michael the Archangel, the patron saint of police officers. The students promised to continue to pray for the law enforcement workers throughout the year. 
Read more about the Blue Mass in this week's Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. Do you think about death? In his thought-provoking Herald of Hope column, Archbishop Listecki focuses upon prayer, our deceased loved ones, and how Catholics should approach the arrangements for their own burials. The Archbishop writes, Believers know that the sorrow of death gives way to the promise of eternal life. It is the promise of Jesus that gives us the assurance that we shall meet again and that our loved ones are members of God's kingdom, waiting for some future time when we shall join them. To make sure your next of kin are aware of your funeral plans, the Archbishop recommends you state your request for a mass of Christian burial and proper burial of your body or ashes, should you opt for cremation, in a respectful and dignified manner. Read more of the Archbishop's thoughts in the Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. Updates of Catholic news and information appear regularly at catholicherald.org, so you'll always be current on what is happening in the Catholic Church. Wishing you a great weekend. This is Grace David. Thank you for listening. We now return you to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. Welcome back to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. And, Jerry, I have to tell you that when I sat down to watch this program... Uh, I, I, my emotions ran the gamut. Originally, I looked at this and I said, this man is guilty. Then I said, no, this man is innocent. Then I said, no, this man is guilty. Then back to the, back to the side of innocence. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what this has been like, how this has affected you personally, how this has uh, put a test on your faith. Maybe we can ask Jerry, for, first of all, to tell us just a little bit about the, the, story. the, the story itself so that to bring our, our listeners right. in. Right, yeah, because I assume that. that everybody's watched, watched this and, and they haven't. Thank you, Your Excellency. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, the, the case, um, the, you know, there are unique things about the case, and, and there are things that are not so unique that are common in, in, in all cases. But in this instance, Stephen Avery was, was wrongly convicted. He spent 18 years in prison for... A sexual assault he was later proven to be innocent of, and in fact, the DNA matched the real perpetrator uh, who had gone off and assaulted another woman while Mr. Avery was sitting in prison wrongly. So he gets out. He's out for about two years. Um, there are reform efforts going underway. He's, he's become a bit of a celebrity. Uh, he's about to receive a large $400,000 tax-free payment from the legislature as part of his compensation for the wrongful conviction. And he he then had a $36 million lawsuit pending against Manitowoc County for things that he discovered looked like he was being um, sort of framed in that case. And then suddenly he gets charged with the homicide of of Teresa Halbach, um, a young photographer for Auto Trader magazine. Uh, And that's when a few months later, Dean Strang and I got hired to to represent him. And then the documentarians followed us throughout the the pretrial and trial process. How long was that process? Because we we, we watched it over 10 episodes. But the trial, we were on the case for probably a year and a half. The trial itself was six weeks long. And uh, obviously they had to condense you know, the, the, those into 10 hours. I thought they did a very excellent job. I think it really, in those 10 hours, you learn a lot about the case and the evidence, particularly the evidence that was most disputed by the sides. Matter of fact, I, I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could have done the whole trial in 10 hours <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll bet. instead of six weeks. Did you think it was going to be as sensational? You know, when you finish, <laughs> when you finish it, obviously, you know, you're, there's some closure, whether it's guilty or, or, or not guilty. You feel there's closure, and then maybe the appeal process uh, goes in. But did you think it would be revisited with with such sensationalism? No, no, no. I don't think anybody, not even Netflix, expected this kind of reaction from it. Um, we did know, of course, that we were being filmed, and we cooperated with the fil- the the filmmakers. And we thought that the prosecution was as well. They were offered many times an opportunity to do that, but... Uh, I was hesitant at first, but I, I thought that, you know, this would be an opportunity to, for people to see really behind the scenes what it's like to be the defense attorney in a serious case like this. So I thought it would be a good public education thing. But as years went by and, you know, eight or nine years went by after the trial before it finally aired, I began to, began to doubt it ever would and certainly didn't expect this kind of reaction. But, you know, it's interesting, during the trial itself, there was a lot of publicity, and we knew we were dealing with a very high-publicity case. Sure. But all of the focus on my co-counsel and I was pretty much negative at that point because 
the, the public thought only one view of Mr. Avery, the one that was originally presented by the prosecution in their press conference, and then repeated ad nauseum on the media. One example of that is the story of uh, Ash Wednesday. We, uh, our, our usual routine was we would be in court from 8 or 8.15 until 5 o'clock. Then we'd have a brief press conference, and then we would go, Dean and I would go eat dinner, and then back to our apartments. We had rented separate apartments in the area, and we would work until we go to bed. That was it. But on Ash Wednesday, we said after dinner, you know, let's, let's go to Mass. And so we did. We picked a church. We knew that the, the victim's family was Catholic and that they were, we knew their church. And we went as far away as we could. But it was still obvious. You know, when the two of us walked around, people knew who we were. And I remember walking down the aisle and getting dagger looks thrown at me and, and thinking, come on, people, this is a church. Mm-hmm. But then and we go. You are dust. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then the, 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 the wrap up to that story is kind of interesting because we go back to the, the apartments. And as sometimes happened in the evenings, we would get uh, requests from the filmmakers to, to come in and just sort of set up and uh, be a fly on the wall filming as we were preparing and brainstorming. So at nine, it's at least 9 o'clock now. The knock on the door, and there's the filmmakers. Our first reaction was, oh, come on, we're tired. We, <laughs> we've only got a couple more hours to work. Please, 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 we'll, we'll, you know, we won't uh, intrude. We'll be off in the corner. And, and so they, we said, all right. So they came in, set up. And uh, after a few minutes, before they started rolling, they said, well, don't you want to clean up first? And we were like, what do you mean? Well, you know, those ashes on your forehead, don't you want to wipe those <laughs> off? And we looked at each other and just said, smiled and said, no, we don't. <laughs> Good for you. Good. <laughs> and I never expected that scene to be in the documentary, but it is. And the number of, of uh, Catholics and Christians that have contacted me from that one scene, not realizing our faith, has been remarkable. Yeah, that, that, that's really taking your faith, right? Yes, right. And wearing it on your sleeve or maybe <laughs> right. on your forehead, and, right. you know, uh, into the public. Tell me, in helping an uh, individual like um, uh, a, a Mr. Avery, how do you, how do you balance, in, in, you know, you, the public per- perception, your own integrity and responsibility and responsibleness to the to the defendant, and basically your view of it? How do you, how do you say? Down with the the system, down with the system, and how do you keep yourself from you know from falling into those traps that that all of us do when when, when we're caught in the situation? Well, you know that is kind of a daily challenge. It's it's sometimes um, uh, you know as a defense attorney, you frankly lose most of the time. You should lose most of the time when it comes to trials because a prosecutor can control what case goes. If the case is very weak for the state, they can dismiss it or make an offer that the defendant can't refuse. And so the cases that go to trial are uh, usually very challenging for the defense. And, um, you know, you you can't, you, you've got to maintain your integrity and your honesty. And, you know, the rules of ethics that lawyers are supposed to abide by help, certainly. But then when you lose sometimes, it's difficult to not despair and, and think, particularly if you think an, an injustice was done, as in, as I feel like in this case. Um it's very difficult sometimes to pull yourself back up, but we, but we have to do it, and and so we do do it, and it you know sometimes it involves prayer, um, distancing yourself from, and you know this case was a very probably the most difficult one for me to disengage from. We, we had lived it so much, you know, every waking moment, going through all you know twenty five thousand pages of discovery, hundreds of hours of recordings, trying to get all that organized and in your brain. Um, and then suddenly, you know, having to disengage from it was a, was a challenge. So it took me several months, really, before I could focus on other cases. I think St. Michael the Archangel prayer would have been the prayer <laughs> that I, I'd have walked into that courtroom with on a daily basis. You, I want to take you back to what you said about the Ash Wednesday service. Sure. You saw the daggers. Uh, what that tells me is that uh, a- Stephen Avery was pretty much convicted in the court of public opinion well in advance. So how challenging was it to find jurors who were open-minded? It was very challenging. He was convicted in the court mm-hmm. of public opinion, largely because of press conferences, a couple, a series of them that the prosecution ran, including one that was, you know, 
live and, and streamed live on the internet in which he warns any anybody under the age of eight of 15 to leave the room and he, t- he tells a narrative that really wasn't true that didn't fit the physical evidence either then or later and um, but then there was a there was in essence a, a sort of gag order that was imposed shortly after that so we couldn't respond in the public opinion uh, field. We had to wait for trial, which was 10 months later. And so the media was forced to just repeat what they, last thing they knew. And as the trial developed, and in the first week, uh, a lot of the reporters were really shocked and amazed, hey, this is a lot closer case than we thought. We didn't know any of this. But by then, a lot of the public had turned to, you know, those who weren't sitting in as jurors had sort of turned away from it, thought they knew everything about the case, they were sick of it. But the jurors, we had the first 129 of the 130 jurors in our pool had filled out questionnaires saying they believed Stephen Avery was guilty wow. before they even walked into court. Is that unusually high, or is that, is that normal? That is high. That is no high. question, yeah. that is high. And, you know, and, and it's difficult to try and, try and you know, they, they're then instructed, well, you know you have to put all that aside, and you have to be fair. And some of them are, you know, sort of struggled with that. Some of them were honest that I simply couldn't be. You really, we had to sort of take them at their word very often, as to whether they were really able to set aside those prejudices or not. Now we're hearing some information. The jurors finally talked to some magazines, and and one of them uh, revealed that the reason that they convicted was because Mr. Avery had raped and tortured that woman, and she suffered so much, which was the press conference information. But none of that came into trial because it Number one, it wasn't true. And number two, they never used that so-called confession of, of Brendan Dassey against Stephen Avery at the trial. So obviously that juror, at least, had, was unable to separate what she had heard outside of court from what she heard in court. Well, God bless you for the work you do uh, and for keeping the faith at work. Uh, Thank you. And all the challenges that you have. It's been a, it's been a very wonderful uh, half hour here, and the time has flown by. We need to take our final break uh, with a reminder for you that everything you need to know about the Archdiocese is at archmill.org. You can also follow this program on Facebook, as well as know that this show will repeat on Saturday morning at 930 and then again on Sunday morning at 930. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. Put more heart in your hands. These are words St. Camillus used to encourage his followers when caring for the sick. And today these words are at the essence of care provided by employees at St. Camillus campus in Wauwatosa. St. Camillus nursing administrator Sandra Dugan shares a recent more heart in your hands moment. An 84-year-old resident who came to us after a massive stroke that left her left side completely paralyzed. Now, five months post-stroke care with our excellent rehab department, she is able to use a walker. She does all of her own activities of daily living with minimal assist, and her memory is great. She's now going to spend her winter in Florida with her niece. The best part is to work with someone at their time of health crisis and then see them return to living a life to their fullest again. For more information regarding St. Camilla's rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. We'd like to thank our guest today, criminal defense lawyer Jerry Buting, for joining us. And as always, we close the show in prayer. Your Excellency, if you would, please. Thank you, Bob. And we'll join together and let us together say the prayer for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we praise Praise you and we bless bless you. you. For you are are great great indeed. indeed. Grant, Grant, we we pray, pray, as on on that that first Pentecost, Pentecost, that that tongues of fire may descend upon us, and and that the the driving wind of your Holy Spirit Spirit may blow boldly into our hearts. Loving God, we ask you, Make us effective and holy witnesses of the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Increase our faith through the sacramental life of the Church. Grant us courage to follow you as faithful disciples. Embolden us, O God, so that we may go forth to proclaim your gospel and renew the face of the earth. In this Archdiocese of Milwaukee, we humbly pray for strength and fortitude to follow your great commission to go and make disciples of all people, living our faith through word and deed, through the intercession of St. John the Evangelist, patron of the Archdiocese, and Mary, Mother of the Church. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas More, patron of lawyers, pray for us. And may God's blessings be upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend, and let's all be transformed by the Spirit. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.